So hello everybody and welcome to our second session of Manishtana. Um, Manishtana, why is this night different? And uh, I'm so happy that we're here for our second session. Uh, this is part of the Gauntlet calendar. Uh, the, we are an online gaming community where we like to play indie games, story games, OSR games. Uh, and so definitely Manishtana is like, um, like the exact kind of game that a lot of us enjoy. So this is an open beta Passover RPG. I describe it more in detail in the first session. I will include a link down in the description below for the first session if you want to check it out. But basically uh, this is a retelling where we breathe new life into the Exodus story and each of us have taken on uh, different uh, important characters from that Exodus story. So I think we'll start with introductions. We'll introduce ourselves and our characters. So um, we'll go in the time honor tradition of character keeper order, which I'm so used to saying that's gonna be Sherry, but this time it's me. <laughs> I was gonna say Sherry. <laughs> me too. <laughs> So, but I'll go ahead and start. So my name is Jamie. I use they, them pronouns and, uh, and I'm playing Moses uh, today. And Moses for this story, for this retelling uses he, they pronouns. Uh, Moses is the husband to Zipporah, the adopted son of Bitya. Uh, oh, you know what? I'll include the character keeper on the screen so the people watching can see this lovely character keeper that was made. Um, for the game. And so just things to consider as I play today, what does it take to speak for yourself? What binds me to the Pharaoh's palace? What does it cost to leave? Oh, I broke my heart last time, it was very sad. Uh, and do you have the heart of a prince or a prophet or something else entirely? So, uh, and just as a reminder to myself, I have the moves, uh, reveal a secret and hold your tongue. Uh, so I can reveal a secret about the Ferris court, or if I choose not to speak what it is expected of me, I get to choose from these options. Um, yeah, and also when someone walks alongside me, so I get to ask them questions or whisper and share something. So something for me to remember. Uh, yeah, and next let's uh, meet Danielle and, and who you're playing. Hi, yes, um, I'm Danielle. Um, I use she, her pronouns playing Tzipora, the wife of Moses, who in this um, retelling still also uses she, her pronouns, but um, I love the questions to consider um, as the kind of an outsider who comes into the family. Um, how are you worthy of your Jewish ancestry? And also who takes care of you and why do you let them? And can love truly heal all wounds? What about the ones love causes? And that's been great to see how um, love can be a force for unity and also blowing things apart as we've been seeing that. Um, and some of the cool moves that she has um, is this one called Smash that in times of great need, you can um, show your faith by doing something dramatic to help them. And then you choose a way in which that will have a cost. And yes, and, um, and also when people are eating at your table, you can ask them questions, which is really neat. Yeah, super awesome. It's like all this. Uh, oops, sorry. And so um, next, uh, Bodhi, if you could introduce yourself and the character you're playing. Hi, I'm Bodhi. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm playing Aaron, the brother to um, Miriam, uh, which who isn't played by a player in our in our retelling of this, and uh, also to Moses. Um, and I to consider as you play questions, they're also great <laughs> for each character, but I, for me, they're how can you learn to forgive if you can? What weakness is truly a strength? Is strength always a virtue? Which I think that Aaron definitely started out with, but maybe won't end with. And um, what does it mean to be a brother? And I can 
I have the moves, um, wield the rod, uh, and also, um, could you could you scroll down a little, Jeremy? Because I have I have your screen on full screen, and I can't. Yeah, there we go. I wield the rod, so when I'm angry, my rod transforms itself and the world around it. And I can also speak to power when someone cannot speak for themselves. I can um, speak speak for them. And um, yeah, and I can ask questions when someone struggles alongside me. Very cool, very cool. And last but not least, uh, Sherry, who's playing Vidya. I am Sherry, you see her pronouns. I'm playing Vidya, who also uses she, her pronouns. She is the adoptive mother of Moses and almost in this plane of Aaron, um, and also daughter to the Pharaoh. Um, her questions are, is blood thicker than water? Where does your loyalty lie? And who do you save? So, um, uh, so this bitch uh, is um, her appearance in her bathhouse. Uh, her, her appearance is unremarkable, except for her ornaments and cosmetics and clothes and posture. Her bathhouse, though, is luxurious, um, beautifully made, clean wa um, water is falling, um, warm and cold to choose from, and it opens up to the banks of the river. And that's usually where you find bitches is actually in the river itself. Um, her handmaidens though stick to the clean waters. That's their preference. Um, she is close to her. This is what one of my uh, things is uh, um, Moses, who she did adopt of the two children, uh, was a gift to her. That is a gift from the river. Um, a responsibility and a joy for the price of defiance. Uh, but it was also a purpose that she chose for herself and it cleared away her emptiness. So Moses has always been something that gave her purpose. And she's very close to her handmaidens. They are like her, unremarkable, only notable when dressed and posed. So, um, and she can do two things. She can be in two places at once. Um, she can call upon her handmaidens to, uh, to take her place while she does something that she desperately needs to do. Um, and of course, when she wants to transform herself or the world, she can do that by immersing herself in the waters of the river. Um, this allows her some leeway. And she can ask questions when someone visits her bathhouse. So um, she's pretty cool. She should be on, yeah. I don't know. I'm looking forward to this. I loved the last session and everything is all set up for tragedy and beauty. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, which brings us to our first ritual. Uh, so I'll, I'll be the ritual guide for this next one. Let me just pull it up. So we are playing the ritual uh, Halach Ma'anya, or let my people go. So, a single stream can carve canyons, a candle can illuminate the darkest pit. And so for the remote ritual action, I'll read it out loud, but we've decided to like pause the recording when we go through it. But uh, for remote play, we'll each take turns describing something you fear you may never have, and why do you deserve it? So for everybody listening or watching, I'm gonna pause here for a second. It'll just be a second for you. Uh, and then we'll be right back after the pause. Okay, so we're back. It was just a second for you. It's a few minutes for us. Um, and so next we're going to set up the scene. So in this scene, the Hebrew people make demands. We play to find out what you want and what you will do to get it. So uh, who is in the scene? What are they doing? What is taking place? Um, and so the idea is, what are we demanding uh, as a Hebrew people? I feel like definitely Aaron. Well, will be it. I mean, if you if you think so. Um, yeah, yeah, I I agree that. Yeah. And I feel also like Moses would be, and maybe this is a place for kind of. Aaron and Moses to interact because we've only seen that interaction as small children and 
seeing that now, that would be really interesting. Yeah, and I think, I, I kind of think like some time has passed, right? Um, from, from, because the last time we saw was like, uh, Aaron like taking out the rod for the first time and then Moses leaving the palace and and Moses and Zipporah like immediately like, missing each other right and but, yeah like uh, like in that moment realizing that something has changed so I think like in the in the interim Moses has been trying to reach out to Aaron and trying to help um, and I don't know how successful it has been necessarily um. I I don't think that Aaron regards I think Aaron is wants to accept Moses as a brother but as a revolutionary I don't I think he's suspicious of their motives. I think that he, he doesn't necessarily believe that anyone who has been born into luxury, who hasn't had the experience of living the life of oppression, can really ever be fully on board with the course. And I, so I think that that's, there's a tension there between how I regard Moses as a brother and how I regard Moses as a, a comrade. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I feel like Moses would definitely need Zipporah to be there to like, support them like trying to be there for Aaron and you know um and so are who are we making our demands to are we making it to the pharaoh or are we asking Bitya? Oh. or are we ask I, oh sorry go ahead I, I was going to say either either would work for me I think that uh Personally, I'd throw that open to, sh to Sherry of whether you want Bitcher to be on the other end of that or in some other place in this. Well, I could see it that the demands are made to the Pharaoh, but Bitya understands what the reaction to those are going to be. And she probably will seek you out to try to convince you to do something less dangerous, if that makes any sense. She wants you to just find a way, something a little less stringent, something strident. Don't be so strident. Or are we reasonable. going to Bitya first to see like, can you, these are the things, can you present them or introduce us or something maybe? Or it could be, I guess, on either side of that. Yeah, I think I feel sense. I feel that Aaron might want to go directly to Pharaoh and maybe ooh ooh maybe Moses and or Zipporah have convinced Aaron against what I feel is is as Aaron feel is my better judgment to go to Bitcher first. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not pleased about this. Yeah, I kind of <laughs> like the idea that this takes place at the bathhouse and both Z Zipporah and I have like convinced you, Aaron, but here we are surrounded by all this finery, all this beauty. And the last time you and I were here was when you were trying to save us, right? So um, yeah, I like that. That's like, and plus we can use Bitya's like questions um, from their playbook, right? Um, yeah, so I think to describe things from, from Moses' perspective, he has been very quiet this whole time. Uh, and, I, and I feel like, Aaron, you can sense that Moses has tried numerous times to reach out to you and say something, 
but instead he just keeps looking at your rod and just keeps falling silent um, and allows Zipporah to lead the way towards the bathhouse. I think Zipporah is, um, you know, kind of like stealing herself, remembering that like uh, <laughs> the last time she, but she hasn't always been like her biggest fan, but um, I think she kind of takes Moses's hand if she can, oh, as if like she's trying to support him, but is looking for that for herself. Um, and as they as they step through into into the bathhouse, um, it's really it's really lovely. And I think that um, yeah, I think that Zafar would um, just be like, um, what I I don't know what title you know not not Her Majesty or something like that Princess Princess Princess, princess. Um, we are humbly here to ask for a um ask for your wisdom and your your moderating influence as she looks over at Aaron on really important matters I think and she'd elbow a couple of them um and I do think Bitchy would put her hands up and say a moment and and it is that thing of when you look, you can see that she's carefully composed your um, your reception, like that she's clearly had warning from as you pass through the palace to get to her bathhouse. And all of her handmaidens are sitting there and they all look just like her. Um, and there's, you know, lovely things set out to uh, repast for you. Um, and she goes, please. And she walks up to Moses and she sort of touches his face. She goes, are you happy? I think when you ask that, Moses places both of their hands on your palms. And, you know, if you do not speak when it is expected of you, you may do the following instead. I'm going to look at hold your tongue. Um, I'm going to remember, ask something about your past from a relevant character. Uh, I want to ask Vidya, like, when was, when was the last time you saw Moses truly happy? Oh, I think it, it was like two or three years previous. Um, it's one of the things is he enjoys the river, but he always enjoyed it in a boat that she'd had made for him. And he'd gotten quite good at like using it. Um, and it was one of the things that he was out out on the river and um, I'm, I may be using the wrong sort of bridge, but he was sort of napping there and a couple of cranes landed on the boat. And when he woke up, they didn't startle, they stayed there. And so he stayed very still and he was delighted. And I think the thing was, is that Bitya was on the shore too. and it was a sort of interaction where the two of them were looking at each other and then looking at the cranes in, in just joy and excitement and like trying to not startle them. So and it was like a sort of moment that even though they were separated by, you know, 20 yards, they were still like, it was very intimate in that moment of just holding your breath because these two beautiful things had come closer than they would otherwise. Yeah, and I think, I think the answer is Moses has the same smile uh, when he was around the birds, when he looks at Zipporah and then he looks back at you. Like, like he's trying to communicate that he wants to share this part of his life with you. All right. 
and I think she will, she'll leave one of her hands on your cheek. She'll reach the other one to Zipporah, put it on her cheek on the other side. Um, and she'll say, all right, I understand. And she'll step back and then I think she'll look at Aaron and she'll go, I'm glad to see you again. Why don't we sit down and have something to eat? And there's all the fruit, there's the almond cakes, there's wine on the table again, Aaron. And I think that the first first statement Aaron's making here isn't isn't a verbal one. I think as you see that Aaron has very conspicuously and obviously very deliberately not washed from his work cleaning out the stables. So he's tracking he's tracking manure into this beautiful bathhouse and it's it's very clearly kind of this is the reality for my people. This it, it kind of I deliberately tried to contrast it with with the lux with the luxury on display here. And so I think I think I accept the food, but I stay standing. I, I think I, I think I refuse the offer to sit and I I thank you for your hospitality but hospitality while you are gracious isn't isn't why we um, I think she stops and nods, um, and I think that I'm gonna ask you, what is here that you can't find anywhere else? I mean, when you're standing here and you see all of these things are right before you. I think that, I think there's a sense of peace here that I have never known. And it, and I, I think because it has such strong memories for me, this place, it almost, it almost causes me to waver, perhaps for the first time in my conviction that this this quest for freedom must be absolute and immediate and complete and warlike and I just I'm longing for that peace and yeah, I don't think I don't think that I say anything about this, but you can see the conflict in emotions on Alan's face. Yeah, and I think Moses understands silence and what that carries. And I think this is the first time Moses feels like they understand Aaron. And Moses places a hand on your shoulder and says, Brother. This is, we may not agree on many things, but I too wish for peace for our people. I wish them the peace of water. I wish them their own land. I wish them to not have to suffer needlessly. And, and I'm saying it to you, but I want Bitya to hear this. Like, I want Vidya to understand that, like, if you love me, you will love my people. You will love my God. And 
I think Bitya hears that, but there are the other handmaidens sitting there. And I think I do want to ask Zipporah, uh, how do you feel? Oh, what do you feel that lets you know you're safe here in this place? And then why is that a lie? Ooh. Um, well, the first, I think the first half is that the, um, the, the beautiful finery, everything is wonderful. I think that this, um, sense of acceptance here with the being held close with, with Moses reminds her of family and she's in a always in a really big group back home and so being included in this makes her kind of relax and feel a little bit more safe I think that what she doesn't quite understand in the same way is that it is conditional on this kind of relationship like like it is a it is an acceptance not of like necessarily her but because of this other relationship um and I don't know if she understands how to parse that in the same way um she's used to love being given freely and or love that is um not had to be so guarded and had to be so careful and so um, she is more prone to assume that it is expansive. And so I'd like to ask, um, how do we call upon God's power to make our demands of the Pharaoh through Vidya? What does that look like? I think I think that when you make your demands, she just sort of stops and she would ask the handmaidens to, as <clears throat> you say, uh, to step outside, actually to create, you know, essentially um, so that no others could come in. And she would take you out to the water because she understands that what you're saying is big and she can't have anyone hearing it until she understands what's going on. Um, and she will say, you know, as you make your demand, she goes, I love you. I want those things for you. Because of that, I can understand why you want them for your pe people. And you can see she wants to reach out to Moses again and that she's hesitant and guilty about Aaron. Like she wants to touch him too, but knows she doesn't deserve to. Um, and, and she sort of stops and she goes, but you aren't talking to me. It will be to the Pharaoh and my father has always seen you as a threat, like he knows something. And this will be the moment that he understands that threat has come to fruition. Unless you can meet him with power, and she sort of stops and says, um, he's my father. And, I, I want, and she sort of stops because at this point she realizes that it's going to be terrible for, you know, and she kind of goes, she goes, and she looks at the river and she goes, I know that things, that, that it has to flow. just don't know what will be lost but tell me and I think because Moses is by the water and it is the one place 
that they are comfortable speaking, he reaches out to you and places and takes your, your hands again and places them against his cheeks and places his forehead against yours. And he says, mother, the Pharaoh is weak. No matter how much power he has, he will not stand before God. It doesn't matter what he speaks of, if he does not speak for God or of God, his words will be drowned out. And as Moses says that, you can see the water is like building up around him. And Moses whispers, those who would speak against my God will find their words drowned. And those who would not hold God in their heart will find that the rain will never stop falling. And then you can see like the water starts to fill the bathhouse and starts to fill the palace. But you mother, what will you say? I've always spoken to him as a daughter. I will go and speak to him as a mother. Then I will say that I love my son. And, and I will tell him your demands. And I will try to make him understand. And but you know her, and you see her, her reaction to mm -hmm. your power with the river and stuff. You know that even though you have said, my God, she understands it as the water and the river. She doesn't make that leap. And then I think when you say that, Moses says, you are his daughter and you are my mother, but you are also chosen. And then Moses places your hands on your heart. Please, mother, Listen to me, listen to God's voice in my voice. I think at this, Aaron, perhaps again for the first time, is Aaron was preparing to to make his demands with fire, to carve them into the walls of the palace and wield the rod to do that, to kind of force his, the urgency and the importance of these demands onto Bitya. And I think Aaron realizes or starts to realize that that isn't the only way that maybe not always the best way and we see that I was standing ahead of you Moses but I I take a step back so that I'm clear I'm allowing you to take the lead and that something that I haven't been able to do before with anyone. And I kind of like the idea of that hanging in the air between us, like that point of tension with Aaron and Moses and Zipporah and Vidya as the waters slowly rise. What do we think? Yeah. I think one of the things is, is Bitya kind of starts to understand um, that it's just tears running down her face and dripping into the water. And it's just like water in water in water. Yeah, and I want to say like the last shot is in the reflection, Bitya looks different. Like Bitya is still Bitya, but, but she is not 
the plain person who depends on the luxuries and the gold to be beautiful. Like there is a beautiful Bidya that believes in herself as much as she believes in the Pharaoh and in Moses, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I really think, like that. <laughs> and so we will end this ritual. I close this ritual and pass the role of uh, ritual guide to Danielle, which is going to bring us to uh, a moment of respite. So I will, but I'll go ahead and start this and then Danielle can be the ritual guide for the next one. Uh, so let's take a break. Uh, and so we'll take a five minute break. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. All right, and I'll see you all in five minutes. For everybody else, we're just gonna pause the recording and see you in a second. <laughs> all right, and we're back from our break. And so our ritual guide, Danielle, if you could guide us through the next ritual, please. Yes, we are um, going to be going through Makot Misraim, the plagues of Egypt, or recounting the plagues. They refused our cries for freedom and ignored the signs. In this scene, God brings forth a reckoning and we will go around to describe an awe-inspiring or awful phenomenon and then um, answer a question for each character and then turn our cameras off, which will remain off during the next scene. So don't be afraid that your computers have um, <laughs> malfunctioned. Oh, but actually, before we started the recording, you asked me if you could, I, I misread it, starting with the ritual guide, it says, I think we'll start with Zipporah, as you said. Okay, no problem. So, yes. Um, my, okay, yeah, just looking at the ritual action. So, one phenomenon, as we were left seeing everyone as, as the waters are, are rising, I think that, um, one phenomenon is definitely not only that they rise, but this idea that excuse me, the waters are not calm. And I think all of the waters of Egypt are tossed. They're, they're, they're violent. The waters are communicating this lack of peace that Aaron refers to, this constant striving that is embodying the struggle here. And I think that that as they're crashing through the through the hallways and places they're not supposed to be overflowing jugs and tossing fishing boats around, it is communicating um, um, communicating this this lack of peace. Um, and for Zipporah, the questions, the action says, a member of your family is afraid. Who and what do you give them so they feel safe? And I think that, I think that for Zipporah, her family is from a, a place where there isn't even this much water. I think they're afraid because they're not used to the kind of um the kind of tossing and turning of the waves at all to begin with and i think that as she is um as she is still kind of going between moses and then seeing her family that are in the city she um she brings them a um I'm trying to think of exactly how to describe it, but something to um, like something to kind of like measure like the wind by like, yes, if you can't tell because the, the, the waters are, are, are actually, well, not, not actually that, but I think she, she's bringing, she brings them, um, a vessel from Moses that is one of the ones that he that that they use that where he keeps the water that is like helps him calm help helps him be calm and I think that because this vessel is is his that it's like the one place where they can put water in it and it and it is still 
Um, and I think that she's able to sort of borrow that peace from that sense of peace from them and, and bring it to her family, even if temporarily. Um, and so I will, there you go. <laughs> Whoop, oh, I am not muted. And then we will move to Moses. Okay, so, oh, or should we go to Vidya if we follow the... Oh, okay, yeah. oh, we'll go... No, you, you are go before me if we go back up to the top of the list. So I'll go to, okay, so it'll be Moses next. Um, yeah, and I think it kind of makes sense in the in the moment. Uh, so describe one phenomenon and answer out loud. I think what happens is that the, that the rivers are flooded, the waters uh, move violently, but also there's lightning that crashes over and over and over again, but it's silent. There's no thunder that announces the lightning. There's no warning. Uh, of when it will strike mm -hmm. and it strikes over and over again at everything that the slaves were forced to build over and over again, just destroying them and leaving behind fire that the waters cannot put out. And when that happens, the answer, the question I have to answer is what treasured part of your life in Pharaoh's court has been destroyed? And I think I think it was slaves that, that built the boat for Moses uh, that he cherished so much, that has such a, such a strong memory associated uh, with Bitya, yeah, his mother. And it's, it's, uh, it's hit by the lightning and it splinters. It looks like it's going to hold for a moment and then it splinters and it starts to burn on top of the water. And then now it goes to Aaron. So yes. I think I'm going to hark back to my entrance to the bathhouse and say that not that in all the houses of the of the rich people of the Egyptians with their clean, polished stone floors. They can now never be clean, however much they are, they are scrubbed, they are washed, they're sluiced out. They, you turn around and there's manure and dirty rushes on the floor again, and it's, it's in every every room in the house. You can't escape from the conditions that the the lowest of the slaves have been forced to live in. That 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 filth is now everywhere. And my question is, who am I unable to shield? And I think, I think ultimately it is the Hebrew people that I'm unable to shield. It's these, these plagues kind of unavoidably, many of them kind of affect the poorest people more just because of kind of how little resilience they they have to anything going wrong they don't have kind of big stores of food when the flooding destroys the crops it's kind of there's there's it it it, it doesn't just affect the oppressors and i i'd long ago steeled my heart to 
the having to go through difficult times on the route to freedom, but my my heart isn't so stony these days. And so I feel that and I kind of, I find myself lying at night kind of wondering whether in the end it will be worth it. Fantastic. And then it um, proceeds to Bidya. So there were the floods and then the storms and then what is referred to as the rushes. <laughs> um, but now it is a sort of a lies that lies on the people. Um, coughing is all you hear wherever you go. There are people coughing and coughing and then it's only when they get silent that you know it's bad because that is when they've gotten too weak to cough. Um, and it is, there's no place that you can go where you don't hear coughing. Uh, and I think Bitcha is standing on the balcony with her father and she asks, will you relent now? But she isn't even looking at him. She looks at the Nile and looks at the river and it's gone still. It's glassy at its top, it looks smooth. And she just has this feeling of dread because she knows there's another wave coming and she knows that her father still won't relent. She's never seen anything like this. Wow. All right, as we are waiting in the darkness of the plagues, I close this ritual and pass the role of ritual guide to um, Bodhi. Would you be comfortable with this? Sure. Okay. Yes. And we're going to leave our cameras um, off right now. So uh, this is the ritual of uh, Ratsa. Um, uh, an angel passes over us. After all that you have seen, will your faith still hold? And um, yeah, as, as Danielle said, we, we keep our cameras off and all players except the ritual guide um, mute ourselves. And now we describe the final act of terrifying might that God sends forth an angel passes over our homes and each player writes down the answer to one of the following questions in silence and um yeah each each character has um has a question and i'll i'll read out the ones that apply um to the recording um so Mo moses answers, what does God's angel whisper to you that makes you weep? Um, Aaron, what, what old wound does the angel heal? Why will you miss it? And Z Zipporah, what must you do to prove that you are one of the Hebrew people? And Bitya, what must you endure in exchange for God's mercy? Do you accept the terms? And once all the players are done writing, which I'll ask you to indicate in the chat, um, we sit in silence for one law, long moment, and then read the answers aloud in order, um, unmuting ourselves as we do. 
and um, yeah, I'll I'll invite invite you to read in the chat.
And so the question of Moses was, what does the angel of God say to you? And how does it, why does it make you weep? And what Moses heard was, you cannot save everyone for not everyone desires to be saved. And this makes Moses weep. So Pora's question was, <clears throat> what must you do to prove that you are one of the Hebrew people? And the answer is that even as her biological family is free to leave, to flee, to tend to their flocks, Sipora is no longer going wherever is best for the situation. She stays where this people lives. So she effectively leaves her home and opens the space in this, in this home, in this dwelling. Um, she shares with Moses for people to come in and stay with them if they do not also have a place. And Alan's question for Alan was, what old wound does the angel heal? Why will you miss it? And the angel heals my scars. And I'm going to miss it, or at least the physical manifestation of my scars. My, my face becomes smooth for the first time. I, I remember and I'll miss it because I wore my suffering as a badge of honor. I feel, um, I feel that without my scars, that my face no longer reflects my reality. I feel unanchored. For Bidja, the question is, what must you endure in exchange for God's mercy? And do you accept the terms? And Bidja understands and knows that she must stand aside and let her brother, the Pharaoh's young son, die so that the Pharaoh can understand the price of his continued tyranny. And though she hesitates, she does accept these terms, but she goes to spend the night with her brother's mother, um, third wife of the Pharaoh, and is there in the morning on the discovery of the death of the prince. She does not look away and she grieves with his mother and she grieves for her brother. I close this ritual and pass the role of ritual guide to Sherry, if you're happy to take it. I am. I'm glad to see your faces again. Uh, so here, this is a motse motso, which is letting go. Uh, the time has come to leave. How will you carry? What will you carry with you? So uh, we're all going to describe something we miss and how we may or may not have moved on. Um, and I'll pause the recording um, before we answer this question. 
so we're done uh, with the remote part of the ritual uh, and we'll move on with the rest of it. The Hebrew people flee Egypt in a hurry. In this scene, something or someone is left behind. We play to find out what convinces us to let go. So, who do we think is being seen? Yeah, what do we think is going to be left behind? I feel like answering who or what will be hard to leave might tell us who's going to be in the scene. Yeah, I, I want to suggest, and feel free to wait, wait, wait this, of course. I want to suggest that Avon's left behind, that Avon doesn't, doesn't find doesn't get to experience the freedom that that he's fought for. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait, okay, yeah. 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 wait, 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 wait. You know what? Oh, I, I oh, want to makes me so sad. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that because like Aaron has already left as a toddler, you know. Um, I want to yeah. say that Aaron yeah. was ready to make that sacrifice. I feel like you were fighting off the Pharaoh's army and, you know, you were fully ready to sacrifice yourself, but Moses shows up in a rage, right? Using like, it's not even the power of God. It's not even anything supernatural. It's just that Moses is willing to fight to the death for you. And I think, I think that reaches you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, even with all the things that I've discovered, I didn't expect anyone to be willing to do that for me. I'm the one who does that for other people. And, I think it yeah. makes sense that it was Vidya who did hope to go with you, but in the end, oh my God, um, sorry. Um, in the end, I think she stands in between uh, the army and the thing that they can't, they can't kill her and she delays them so that more people can make it through. Mm -hmm. I was almost gonna think, ask if it was that she has to leave the bathhouse behind. <laughs> like if Vitya does come Do you if think, like she wouldn't because of that yeah um, i i don't know i was i would if she wouldn't then that uh, then it's totally makes sense but um oh well i mean you can't take the bathhouse with you yeah but, <laughs> but though it's like i think she's moved past that as her demands and it, it's like it's a place and she loves it it's familiar, but I think that it really is Aaron and Moses and God in the dream of what could have been that carries her along. Um, yeah, I do think she would, she would be the one that doesn't go. And, and in some ways, it's the realization that even though she has kind of come to understand the one God, it's that she understands that it's Aaron and Moses that is why she is here and that maybe in some ways she needs to just protect them so that they can go, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that I last think, way. Yeah, and I think Moses is going to have a hard time accepting it because he was able to save Aaron. And so when Moses sees you, he's covered in wounds and he's bleeding. Um, and he just assumes that you're going to come. And so, you know, he, he takes your and hand. she lets you. She makes the gesture that she's going to be there right behind you. And I think like, but I know my mother and I love her so much. I know when she's lying to me. Um, oh, oh, but Zipporah is here, so she yeah. will push Zipporah so that you know that you have to take her with you. 
because no one's more manipulative than a mother. So please, <laughs> they do it for you, though it's good for you. I think, um, oh, you know, um, I almost want to use that move when someone wants something that Zipporah has, which is when someone wants something you provide, whether it be the answer to a question, et cetera, a shoulder to cry on, and then you, you choose one. I think that, um, especially if this is on the edge of say, like the, 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 the C to cross over, um, you know, Aaron has done his stand. I think um, as Bitchy is kind of bustling them, I think Zipporah like grabs her hand before she can, turn away and takes Moses's and like connects them to give them the um to to either let Moses take her or like let them have that connection if Bitya wants that you know wants the relationship and Moses wants this relationship to not end I think she would connect them and in return you're left wanting in the sense of like Zipporah will go ahead and like wait there. She she knows that there's something bigger happening than her and she's willing to give up that moment. I think Aaron sees that moment in the distance and I think that still wishes that he could have a moment like that, but knows that he can't and turns away. And uh, I think I think Moses will look at Bidya and he says, I will meet you in the promised land. And he doesn't know if it's going to be true or not. She looks so grateful. And she kisses her hand. And then she turns and she summons up what regal bearing she still has to slow the soldiers that are coming. And I think Moses takes Zippor's hand and runs towards Aaron. And I think that's where the scene ends. So Sherry, would you like to close the ritual? Oh, sorry, you're muted. Yes, as soon as I can read again. Um, so here we go. Uh, so uh, let's see here. Dictator moves. Okay. Um, I close this ritual and I pass the role of ritual guide to Jamie. Yeah, so do we want to um, do we want to take our last break here uh, and like maybe a five minute break and then we'll go into the next ritual? Is everybody okay with that? All right, I'll see you all in five minutes. <laughs> all right, and we're back. And so uh, next is our ritual of uh, Shulia and Orai. Orai uh, a moment of respite. So, oops, sorry, no, no, no. We're going through the next one. Uh, Maror, um, breaking through. So with danger at all sides, do you trust the path ahead? And so for remote play, we eat something we don't like, but are willing to eat. So I have this horrible uh, set of crackers. <laughs> it is, um, they like, it's, it's, they forced omega-3 on it. I don't know. It's, it's one of those healthy versions of a cracker. And uh. like, <laughs> it's fine, I guess. <laughs> it's okay. It's not, it's horrible though, but it's fine. Um, what does everyone else have? I have some literal kale that I pulled out because as I think Cody mentioned before, it's 
hard. You look around, you're like, I don't really buy stuff that I don't eat because what is the point of that? Um, so, but I do love this sauteed, but when it's not, you know, in garlic and stuff like that, when it's not, it's like a chore. My sister came to my rescue. It's off brand Valentine candies that they slapped a brand name onto, but these no. taste like the 1970s. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The worst. Um, uh, mind you, I'll eat them because I'm that kind of person, but they are horrible. Uh. So I had a really hard time with this because there is, um, there's, there's very few foods that I don't like. So I, I eventually went with a food that isn't really a food that you're meant to eat on its own. And I have some mustard. Perfect. All right. So shall we all pause? Take? <laughs> Thank It's worse than I remember. Ooh, yeah, that was a big spoonful. <laughs> I feel it's not really fulfilling the purpose of the ritual if it's actually a small enough amount that I still enjoy eating it. So I just went all in. <laughs> Ooh, I admire that. Mine tastes like plastic that was left in an attic that's what it tastes like oh oh and, and paper lots of old paper uh, okay <laughs> so it's nice i'm definitely getting the, um the bitterness that gets all cooked out of kale by the time i normally have it and anything else how's the how's the candy All I can say is it tastes like the 1970s. It's it's like straight out of a vat with sugar. Um, there's no nuance. It's, yeah. And I guess it's sour. It's sour in the way that they put some aloe in it. So. Amazing, amazing. All right. So uh, when we set up the scene, in this scene, the fleeing Hebrew people encounter an obstacle blocking their way to freedom. We play to find out how you rally the Hebrew people, what do you overcome? So I'm aware of the time, though I really am excited about this ritual. Do we feel like we have the time to role play this out entirely or would you like me to simply narrate it as the ritual guide? I'm cool if you will want to narrate it. Uh, yeah, and we, and we can wait, wait, wait if there's a detail that like we have to get in. Yeah, that sounds good. And also gets around kind of bit you're not really being there anymore. It kind of feels feels nicer from that perspective. Yeah, and I think, um, so I'll go ahead and narrate what happens, but um, I also want to, if you want to go, wait, 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 I'm going to role play this part, please feel free. So just think of it as me really like hard framing <laughs> as a GM, right? Um, so I think what happens is as you as we as we leave behind Egypt, um, I think the rains haven't stopped. I think the rivers are still flooding. Um, and so but Moses and Aaron knew this was going to happen. And so we we have our boats and the Pharaoh's armies are struggling to build them because they've been destroyed by by the lightning. Um, but I do think the magicians of the pharaoh, a few of them knew what was going to happen. And so there's like one large boat. Um, and the rest of us are, are in all these different boats um, trying to get across the waves. And Moses turns to Zipporah and, and Aaron. Um, and so I have to ask, the Egyptians have set a trap. Why is it inescapable? What do we think, uh, Zipporah? You're sorry, you're muted. We, sorry, we're so we're in the boats, or we have crossed, or okay, we. I think that um, I think that when they saw that their boats were wrecked, they didn't want to leave any that were whole. 
And so they have, we are noticing that there are things that are leaking, like the, the boats pieces are coming out that we didn't in our rush until we were out on them. Yeah, like they sabotaged our boats. Right? Yeah, because they saw that God's lightning did not destroy the boats that we were going to use. Yeah, I like that. And I think, um, and so as people, as some of the boats look like they're going to take in water, uh, I think we're trying to like have people move into the stronger boats. We just have to get across as quickly as possible onto the other side. Um, but Aaron, God demands a show of faith. What must you do? I... I think that I must, and I hear this voice of God very clearly. I've, I've not heard this so directly before. I must not do anything. I must sit and let others sort this out which goes against all my instincts and I even as people ask me to help and ask me what to do I'm I know that I must I must say that I don't know even though I have ideas even though I I think I would be able to solve this. God has told me that if I take the lead on this, there will be terrible consequences. What I do will, will backfire horribly. So I just have to sit there and do nothing. And I think what happens next is Moses is realizes there's no way they're going to, that we're going to make it across in time but Moses says God I trust you if the waters must hold us then I trust you and I look at Aaron and I look at Zipporah and I say in a voice and God carries my voice across to everyone so that they can hear me and I touch the water and I remember my mother who I love so much and I say we must walk into the water. We must walk onto the land underneath. The water will not harm us. God will protect us. If we speak God's name, we will not drown. And so that's when Moses opens his mouth and he sings the true name of God for the first time and he steps into the water and he waits for everyone to follow. And Aaron sees this and he would have um, he would have dried the sea. He would have got rid of the water entirely. It would have been an environmental catastrophe. And he now knows why God uh, uh, commanded him to stay silent and stay his hand. And I think there's a moment where we see all of the people just dropping into the ocean, into the water. And there's this, we see them walking on the ground under the water, their robes moving around them. But Moses is singing under the water and we can hear all, we can all hear Moses' voice, even though it's impossible. And we know that God is taking care of us and that God is guiding us. And, and I, I think, think oh, that go ahead. Oh, no, no problem. Um, I think that when they come out the other side, I think that we see that in the water, it has taken away Zipporah's, like, she had a necklace from home that was a symbol of um, 
kind of like her old faith and I think it's it's washed it I think that her clothes are even a different color like she comes out and it is the blue of the of the water and it's um it's it's just it's fully pulled everything else before away and I think when uh, Moses sees that he smiles at you um, knowing that it's a sign that God uh, that God has chosen you alongside as well but yeah and I think when we when we come up from the water we see in the distance the pharaohs you know large ships full of full of his magicians just completely missing us because they're focused on the boats that we have left behind and they can't find us anywhere. Okay, are we all right with ending the ritual? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I close this ritual and I pass the role of ritual guide. Uh, I think I'm gonna pass it back to Danielle if Danielle's okay with it. Okay. Um, and then do we do the, uh, do we, uh, are we doing the moment of respite there or we can, or do we want to skip to the next with the reflection? Yeah, we can, we can skip to the, to the next, I think it's called. Okay. It's uh, it's Kore. Mm -hmm. Kore. Kore. Okay. Or, yeah. Kore. Karai sandwich, <laughs> which is a word that means it, but it's the uh, reflection. So who are we now? And everyone will choose one of the questions in your character playbook and they consider as you play question and actually answer it. So we'll each go in turn to build a little epilogue for our character based on the, one of these questions and um I is it okay if we go hmm, in we, character keeper order yeah or, yeah just so that or I I like the idea of ending with Moses too but I don't want to make Bitchy go first <laughs> necessarily so I can why don't I go first and then we go in reverse character keeper order so okay so one of the, let me just look over these questions really, really quick. I think that, so one of Zipporah's questions is, can love truly heal all wounds? And what about the ones love causes? I think that as Zipporah takes Moses's hand and is sort of reborn into this new identity that bears out in this new venture, I think that um, that she tries to make her love paper over any, you know, cover over these these wounds of leaving home leaving you know the hope of a new home um you by making things as cozy as possible in their tent by opening up a space to host people but I think that um I think it is still a process of growth for her to make peace with the idea that this like leaving space for the not wreckage that love leaves behind, but those places where it needs to be honored. Um, I think that she's also with each step that they take further realizing that if her, if their love can't answer it is truly like god's love in the provision and in the actions of others in the community that is the sustaining um aspect 
worked for them and for her as well as she then in turn tries to help nourish the community around her um and finding her identity in that instead of a specific familial tie is both a new journey and something that I think she incorporates into her life. So, and then we'll go to... Good, Bitya. Yeah, Bitya. <clears throat> okay, so one of Bitya's questions is, who do you save? Um, and I think that as you look back at every turn, Vidya has, in her own way, saved herself, saved herself by creating this identity um, of taking people in and becoming someone because of them or because of losing them um, and being and shaping herself that way, taking on the grief that she deserves. It, she saved herself by just taking those steps, making that choice, and defining herself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she loved all of you, but it was her that she was saving at each of those steps. Uh, so should I go next or should it be Aaron? I think Aaron, Aaron is next. Yes. If that's okay. Yeah. So one of the questions for Aaron is what does it mean to be a brother? And I think that Aaron always thought of being a brother as being a protector, but he's realized that it also means allowing yourself to be protected and held. And I think for Aaron's epilogue, we see kind of a montage of Aaron not as he imagined himself as a leader, as a military figure, but still doing hard work with his hands, but building, building a new home for his people. And so, uh, Bidya, did you want to describe an epilogue for yourself or? I, I didn't, um, I think, I think after her brave stand, she's taken back to the Pharaoh. Um, and we say she's the daughter of the princess. So of course you can't have her executed. So uh, she's confined to her bathhouse. Um, and I think you see she, she turns away her handmaidens because they shouldn't be held. And and she goes out every evening and she sends off little boats with lamps of oil in them. And she says prayers and she makes up her own set of rituals to carry herself until until she can join Moses and Aaron and even Zipporah in, <laughs> in the promised land. Yeah, and um, can I wait, wait, wait um, and ask and say, uh, is there a is there a small boat that has two infants in it? that find their way to the bathhouse. Ooh. That would be lovely, certainly. Uh-oh, yes. Oh, oh, oh. How can you choose those babies over me, mom? 
Exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were kittens that were the infants. So. <laughs> and uh, I think for Moses, so one of the questions is, do you have the heart of a prince or a prophet or something else entirely? And I think the answer is something else entirely. I think what guided Moses was his love for his mother, his love for his brother, his love for Zipporah. And so I think Moses found that when they were by themselves, they were so scared of the voice of God and they were so overwhelmed uh, by this responsibility. But the more that they allowed others to help them, um, the more that they trusted and believed in God, I think. So I think the answer is that um, it was the heart of love, of family that Moses has. And I think that epilogue is, I think we see Moses um, able to talk, like once they've reached the promised land, Moses for the first time is able to talk freely and he talks to his brother and he talks to his wife. Uh, but I think every night he still sits by the river and he talks to Bithya, hoping that his, her, his words will reach her. And I think during the day he builds a home for Bithya to, to, to come to one day. So you have to wait, wait, wait that and say that it happens. So that's the point at the moment. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But two children show up. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I think that at some point, like a few years or many years down the line, 15, 16, two children come and they have with them Bitya's earrings. And they say that they were sent here. They are your, your brother and your sister. And uh, I think Moses will smile sadly, uh, but accept them. I think by that time, Moses and Zipporah also have children uh, of their own. But um, I think Moses looks towards Egypt. And I think we end on like Moses considering, will he go back to Egypt? for a bit, yeah, and will he take his family with him? Sorry, that's me. Um, so yes, I close this ritual and I pass the role of ritual guide to Bodhi, if that is, um, okay. Sure. Yeah, so this is Baraya, a uh, blessing. Um, we now revisit the question at the heart of our story. Why is this night different from all other nights? And our remote ritual is to make ourselves comfortable and take a sip of our drink in the most indulgent way possible. <laughs> fresh. Oh, nice. Mm. That's such a cute mug, too. I'm just getting mine. I forgot that I was, I was like, I was getting out. I love the Moomin mug, yeah. Sherry. That's so cute. <laughs> I love that you recognize the Moomin mug. Yes. I was, um, yeah. I we random note, I, we lived in Finland for two years when I was really young. And so, I got to know them, but they are such great little mugs. I am now here. <laughs> so we reflect on the story we have just told and take turns answering the following questions. You're encouraged to use wait, wait, wait. These questions are from the traditional Passover Seder. However, interpret them as you wish, dream together and imagine new possibilities. And I'm aware of the time, so I don't know what we 
feel about this, whether we just go through this quickly, whether we agree we're going to, whether everyone's able and wants to take a little more time. Um, yeah, good question. How are you feeling? Do we want to like another 10, 15 minutes or do we want to like just go through this quickly? Doesn't it go until 1130? We started at 830. Oh, no, no, because no, it's a it's just it was... two and a half hours. <laughs> oh, yeah, I never pay attention to time. You could see why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very laid I, back. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm very happy to take a little extra time. Yes. I don't have anywhere I need to be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Cool. Cool. Um, so, and I think I'll invite people just to kind of start as they as, as they want to, whoever kind of has idea first, kind of pipe up and then we can use wait 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 to explore things so first question is on all the other nights we may eat either leavened or unleavened bread but on this night only unleavened bread why mm. i Oh, go ahead, Cherry. Uh, you go ahead. We'll wait. We'll I, wait, I, wait. I, I, I feel bad being the one leading it, but I, I, I have an idea for yeah. this. I think that it's. I think that because unleavened bread is just flour and water, I think it's the closer connection with water that that you get from that and I think it's to I think it's to honor Bitya's role. Mm -hmm. It is no it is to honor Moses's closeness with the water. <laughs> so perhaps Moses says that it's for Bitya, but everyone knows <laughs> that it's for Moses. It's one of those, it's not a good, a great traditions always have multiple meanings that you can bring to them or take from them. That's true, that's true. And on, on all other nights, we may eat any kind of herb, but on this night, only bitter herbs. Why? To honor our losses. For the past yeah. year. Yeah. And I, and I think also like the bitterness that Aaron had towards Moses and the bitterness that um that Moses had towards the Pharaoh. Like it was just and 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 even like the bittersweet love, right? Like even though Moses loved uh all of his family so much, he could not save all of them, right? He had to leave someone behind. And on all the other nights, we do not dip even once, but on this night twice. Why? And this um, in the traditional Seder refers to dipping the herbs in, um, in salt water before, before they're eaten. Uh, do you remember the walk through the water? Yeah. To get to the I other side, yeah. This, yeah, this really, yeah, yeah the idea of immersion is so built in. Um, yeah, which, but then the idea of twice instead of just once as well, like going in and the possibility of going back maybe or something like that, or the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, like that. That's, yeah, I really like that. And finally, on all other nights, we eat and drink either sitting or leaning. But on this night, we all lean. Why? I think, I think it represents how Aaron had to just lean and wait 
I think like there are all these like paintings and images um, of Aaron just leaning on the boat and and uh, not sitting up right to to attend to someone or, or do something. I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really good. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, I I, I lo love all of all of everyone's ideas. Thank you. I closed this ritual and passed the role of ritual guide to Sherry. If you're if you're happy with that, it's um. I, I thought we can carry on going round. That sounds wonderful. All right. So this is a Tazpun, hidden, it's a new ritual. Languages change, people scatter, but rituals last. Um, so we want to describe a small ritual of any sort that you perform in your daily life. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have this ritual every morning when my cat tries to wake me up to feed him. <laughs> he's been pretty good lately. Lately, he's been waiting for the sun to come up. Um, but I call his name and then I, I pat him on the bed. So we've been fighting for years about feeding him in the morning. But I finally hit this ritual for the last few months where I just pat on the bed, he jumps up, and then I just like, I just keep petting him until he calms down uh, while, while, my, while my partner gets the cat food ready. So I start every morning with running going wow, 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 right by my face and I'm just petting and feeling all the purring. <laughs> so it's a nice way to start. And then I go back to sleep. <laughs> like after the cats get fed. <laughs> I wonder if we're all going to have cat-based rituals. I mean, if you have cats, they train you they do, and those. they like rituals. Yeah, they like the thing to always be the same. So my cat insists that when I actually finally get up out of bed, that the first thing I do is I go and I turn on the water in the bathroom seat so she can drink there, and I have to stay and pet her. Um, and then, then I may do whatever else is required for the morning, but that is the first thing. It's how she knows I'm actually awake. I love that she is adding her commentary oh, yes. <laughs> actively. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I don't have cats, so that might explain the lack of regularity in my life. <laughs> um, um, I... I... I wish that I had like a um, a ritual that is sometimes for the sake of itself and not when, when I think of things that I do daily, it's things that needs compel me to do or that I do. I, I do always every day though, pretty much as I'm grabbing my phone to silence whatever alarms I, I have or not, um, is I do check to see like my messages to see whether like my family is messaged or my friends have messaged. And it's something that does blend that space between waking and sleeping, which can lead to some really interesting experiences of like, did, did you actually say this or was I still asleep? <laughs> um, and it, it is, um, it is still kind of like a lovely, thing to feel connect it is is a moment that I realize what I'm looking for in that connection you know if I'm not you know brushing my teeth brushing my teeth etc it's that sense of connection that gets me fully into the rest of my day and for me rituals I, I have there are a multitude of kind of scattered tiny ritual things that I do in particular ways. And I think partly it's just how I am and partly it's I learned it from my dad because he lives in much the same way. And the one I'm going to choose today is I drink from this mug in particular. And a few months ago in, in the summer, 
I had a have quite a transformative have month in my life where I have some things that I'd been struggling with really turned around and I was in a, a kind of semi like perfectly livable but kind of like not really designed as a living space farmhouse in up in the hills in North Wales <laughs> and um and for that month for kind of a variety of reasons and this mug was there in the kitchen and because this place is being kind of remodeled and redeveloped and everything's being taken out I could just take this mug and it reminds me of that time and to kind of keep going with the transformation and growth that I felt then so yeah I just drink from that mug and it reminds me of that perfect perfect Oh, I think Sherry might have had to step away for a moment. So uh, I'll just continue in the meantime. So uh, let's see. For this ritual, uh, we create as a group a new ritual we can perform the next time we play, honoring a key moment from our game and adding our voices to the story of Passover. So uh, what ritual do we want to create? that reflects a key moment. That's that's a hard one to be kind of... <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about that. We're no calm. worries. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's okay. <gasps> I, I let everyone into the question so we, we get to... Thank you, uh, I apologize. No, it's okay. No worries. The, the open door policy yeah. is there for a reason, so. Um, but yeah, so what what ritual would we like to create um, honoring a key moment. I kind of, I keep thinking about the time Aaron first picked up the rod and we were all like, oh, <gasps> you know, like, but I, I'm trying to think of like how to translate it into a ritual. Mm. I, I wonder if something about, <sighs> maybe someone mentions or kind of relates an injustice that they have witnessed or that has affected them or just that's out in the world. And maybe everyone grabs something and kind of like <coughs> bangs on the, um, on the table or on the floor to kind of make, make a noise to kind of show kind of like that, we do something about injustice, we don't stand there and let it happen. Yeah, I really like the idea of it being as a result of when people talk about it, that it communicates our collective attitude and action. That's, that's lovely, yes. Is there any other rituals you want to add or do we like that one? We did, we did so many, we did such a good job of t t talking about the, the, the regular traditions and incorporating a lot of the water imagery. So I'm so satisfied um, with that. Um, it would be, because I, I do like the idea that what got included is like that I'll meet you in the promised land. Like the idea of that greeting that can echo as put like, like, it's like an au revoir. We're not, I'm not going to say goodbye. I will instead say, I'll meet you in the promised land. I love that. Yeah, that's so sweet. Yeah, those feel gorgeous. Okay, so do we are we happy with the rituals that we've chosen? 
All right, then I will close this ritual then and pass the rule of ritual guide to, oh no, is it Jamie again or is it Danielle? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. Jamie. All right, so this yeah, is the last circle. one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this one is, hello, uh, welcome and thanks. So as we finish the game, we take a moment to appreciate each other's contributions. We invite reflection. So remote, each player toasts another player for something you especially appreciated. Um, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, I'm going to propose a toast to, um, I'm gonna, to, to Bodhi for Aaron, because like, I think it was a very nuanced, like this play of like violence versus acceptance versus, um, I think when you answered Bitya's question of like the peace here uh, in the bathhouse, it was so moving. So I know like when you first picked up the character, you were worried about playing out uh, these moments of like anger and aggression and uh, like bringing nuance to the character, but I thought you did an excellent job. So I really, I really like that. So toast, oh. toast to Aaron, hey. my buddy. <laughs> Um, I want to toast Danielle because I thought she picked up on the themes in every scene and lifted those up so beautifully and so charmingly that it just like it she kept bringing the little tears to my eyes so that was <laughs> so so here's to tears in my eyes okay <laughs> Danielle I've never been so happy to make someone else sad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and oh, yeah, go ahead. I'd like to toast Sherry because the way that you played Bitchio was so, there was so much emotional honesty and consistency there. It, the, it felt so, so real, so connected. So yeah, toast to Chevy and Bitya. Making hard choices and staying behind, but being true to your character. Really lovely. And I would definitely love to toast Jamie, my beautiful husband, my beautiful, my beautiful partner. Thank you. Um, for being such a um an emotional center even in this story um and I I loved how you balanced out the relationships as well so you could see the pull of everyone on them but they were still their own person um and it never felt like you know we've gone too hard here and, and there were some really lovely like I'm um, like bringing you know the voice of God into it and each time you had a really great I love the way you use the move about falling silent and then it was usually that you were the ritual guide so I felt <laughs> bad that we couldn't hop in and give you <laughs> more things but you ha still handled it beautifully it still felt um very authentic to each scene so I love that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and so with that, uh, the next step is we can share a wish if we like. It can be anything, perhaps something you would like to see more of or explore uh, in future games. Um, I just wish we could play again together. Um, I just really like this group I thought it was so much fun um I was I was very moved like there were several times I was like okay I'm gonna start crying <laughs> like like uh, when Sherry's talking it's but just like oh my gosh I'm gonna start crying it's like but I have to stay in character uh so uh but I felt like that for everybody I felt like I had that several times with everybody so I'd love to that's my wish uh does anyone else want to offer a wish I wish I wish for more games like this and specifically in the sense of having, having lots of 
really evocative, really helpful and supportive mechanics that aren't resolution mechanics, that aren't task resolution. It's there's so much more, this game has kind of opened my eyes to the idea that there's kind of, there's so much more you can do with mechanics that isn't task resolution and that task resolution doesn't have to be at the core of your mechanics. And I, I want to see more of that. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree. Yeah, it's a lot like um, I we did. I did a one shot of dialect with some friends, and it's similar in that way, like framing a scene and then playing a scene. But what I really loved about this one is the questions and especially the rituals beforehand, where you get to talk and ask really important and big questions about yourself um in a safe space with people but then also it is a beautiful way that like makes the role play feel natural and like open so it, it doesn't feel like you're being chucked into something like perform um yeah you're all right um there <laughs> so so i wish your wishes um come true uh and uh, yeah, I am amazed. And I want to say that though I'm familiar with the, the sort of basics of Passover, this really took me in a lot deeper to the pieces and stuff. And um, that added a lot of resonance, but also, I don't know what to say, it grounded it in a way that I went, oh, this is, this is, this is a way of walking through an important part of beliefs and family and community that I want to see repeated all over in the world. This is lovely. Um, and yeah, it's such a good way to understand, understand other people, the people that you're playing with and, and the rituals that they do. Um, I understand Passover a little better, perhaps, but also understand the meaning of ritual a little bit better. I don't know what else to say. And I love that. I love what we've made, and I love what is as well. It makes me very curious about using other types of frameworks for this kind of thing. Like, I've, I grew up and remember hearing, like, in the Christian tradition, the Lord's Prayer used as not even just a formula, but as a framework for you start with this kind of prayer and you start with that and then you move to request. And this has really kind of blown that open in my mind of like what structures could one use that are time honored and look at the themes of it. And I also agree with you, Jeremy, about like, it would be so fun to play together again too. So thank you. Um, my, yeah, yeah, my wish is for everyone to feel this um, safe and able to go to places with people. <laughs> yeah, cause like, I feel like now that I've got to play it a few times, I feel like this is a really good game. Like, cause faith is so indescribable and I feel like this game really helps understand what creates faith and what sustains faith, right? Through the different tests and uh, through the different foundations. Um, but yeah, I thought it was just like, and faith in, in anything, right? I feel like as long as we have faith in something, um, it makes us better people. And uh, I really appreciate how this game embodies that faith. Um, but yeah. <laughs> uh, okay all good feelings oh yeah so i wish that more people get to play this so i can talk to them about it there's another thing so really because i want to i want to know i want to know how their story went exactly we're gonna have to talk about it on the goblet for sure and another way <laughs> but yeah Everywhere. so are we are we okay with bringing this last ritual to a close uh, so, um, thank you so much for coming and sharing the story. And so, uh, for everybody who is listening or watching, thank you so much 
for coming along with us. Uh, I, I feel like the story will stay with me for a very long time. Uh, yeah, so it was, uh, we're gonna just do a bit of debrief uh, off recording, but uh, for everybody else, thank you so much and be safe and take care. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>